Uh, my name's Cameron, I work on layout. Uh, I've been at Mozilla for seven and a half years or so. Uh, and today I'm going to give you a sort of very high level overview of what the uh, layout engine in Gecko does. So this is sort of my conception of what the rendering pipeline looks like. We have content on the left coming in as input. So that's DOM tree uh, that has been uh, parsed. And the yellow highlighted bits are the things that the layout engine is responsible for. So really, it's sort of separated into three stages of the pipeline, uh, which uh, BZ mentioned this morning. Uh, so we've got style. So we have, to restart, we have to style all the elements in the DOM. Then we create frames for those elements. And finally, we reflow them to uh, get the actual final layout. So layout's really responsible for determining how the document looks. It's not responsible for doing the actual rendering of it. There's a sort of like a lightly shaded yellow bit there, which is painting and display list cr creation. Uh, that's kind of on the boundary between layout and graphics. And um, Matt's going to talk about that a bit in the graphics session after me. Um, so I've listed directories there about where all the code lives. Uh, we've got C++ code inside the layout directory, uh, the servo Rust code in the last three bits there. So firstly, style. Uh, the style system is basically responsible for computing a value for every property that we support for every element in the DOM. Now, Firefox supports like 200 and something properties, almost 300, I think. Um, so actually, it's a, a fair amount of work. And it does this by sort of combining the DOM structure, information in the DOM with the style sheets that are in the document. So those style sheets might be built-in ones, user agent style sheets. They have rules like that top one there, which says that divs are blocks, so display block, and the style sheets which the author has added to, uh, to the document. So in the end, we've got assignments for every property, uh, values for them for every element. Now, the actual process of generating these uh, style values for every element is kind of split up into two halves. The first half is selector matching, and that's where we determine which of the rules in all of the style sheets uh, a given element matches. So we, in our, my little example here, I've got four rules, or maybe five if you count the first one as two rules, um, and only the third one matches. Uh, so there's a small example, but um, some pages have quite a lot of rules. I've seen Amazon pages with 10,000 rules in style sheets, if I can channel Rutger Hauer for a moment. Um, but we do some tricks to try and make sure that we don't need to look at all of the rules uh, that are in there. So the main trick that we use is uh, we sort of sort these rules into buckets based on what the selector looks like right at the right-hand side. So the bit that's actually going to match the, the target, the thing, that we're, uh, the, the, the thing that we're restyling. So those first two rules will go into a bucket for P elements. Well, the first one will also go into a bucket for div elements. And the last two will go into a bucket for spans. And so because we're styling a span element, we only need to look up the bucket for span selectors with span on, on the right-hand end. And we'll have buckets as well for IDs and classes, a few other things, and a catch-all bucket um, when the selector doesn't have these things. Uh, but we can see that the element doesn't have any ID or class, so that's, that's the only uh, bucket that we need to look up. The second part of the process is that we do the cascade. And that combines the result of selector matching, so the list of rules that matched, with property values that came from our parent element. So in this case, that was a parent div. Uh, and to do that, we look at all of the declarations in the rules that matched, find the most specific one for every property uh, that's mentioned in these rules. In this case, we've only got a single one. So the color property is the only thing mentioned in the, the match rules. And that's the thing which provides the value for the color property in the computed values in the end. So you can see color red in the rule, and then the computed value for color for the span is RGB 24500, which is red. For all the other properties, all 200 and something of them, uh, it depends if it's an inherited or a non-inherited property. So inherited properties just get copied from the parent's style. So in this case, font size gets copied from the parent, 16 pixels, down to the span. And for the non-inherited properties, we assign them their initial values. So display gets inline, that's its initial value. Margin top is zero. And at the end of this process, we've, we've got the computed styles uh, for the element. And the form that we uh, the store these in is the computed style object. So this is a C++ object. 
uh, which recently was called NS style context, if you've come across that. Uh, and it arranges things by uh, having a number of pointers to different style structs. Each style struct is a collection of sometimes related, sometimes not related properties uh, that we sort of group together. Uh, for example, the background style struct, NS style background has background color, background image, background position. NS style display has some kind of more fundamental properties like the display property, MOS binding, overflow X, overflow Y. Uh, NS style font has like font size, font family, and so on. So we've got 23 of these things. Um, and if we add up the size of them all and the size of the computed style object, we get something like almost like three kilobytes of data. So that's actually quite a lot. Uh, and we don't want to have like a unique copy of all of that data for every single element in the DOM. So we try to do a bunch of sharing. So sometimes we can share whole computed style objects. If we detect that a recently styled element is very similar to the one that we're styling now, so maybe it's got the same tag name, same class, same ID, the same parent, then we can just share a pointer to that same computed style object. So that's something that we call it the style sharing cache. Um, we also can share individual style structs in some cases, in many cases, actually, so it's pretty common. Uh, so if you have an element where you don't have any rules that match that set, say, font size, font family, or any of the font properties which are in that font style struct, then we can share that style struct with the parent element because it's going to have all of the same values. And sort of similarly for style structs uh, which have non-inherited properties in them, uh, if there's no rules matching that set, them, that set them, we can share a pointer to the one struct which just has all of the initial values in it. So the important thing that allows us to do that kind of sharing is that each of these style structs only ever contains either inherited properties or only non-inherited properties. So we produce this computed style object. It's a C++ object, but we actually fill it in from the Rust code. Uh, and we sort of hang that off the element in some field. We also record which rules were matched when we did uh, the, the selector matching to produce this computed style so that we can skip doing that process of selector matching in some cases if we detect that when we're restyling, uh, we're not going to change which rules act the element actually matched. And that's pretty common. So if you change the color property on the root element of the document, uh, you want to restyle all of the descendants because we need that color to inherit down, but none of those elements are going to change which rules they actually match. So we can sort of skip half of the process by recording which rules uh, the element matched last time. So I'm not going to talk about the sort of data structure that we use for, for that, but just think of it as it's just a, a fancy way uh, to record a list of rules uh, that matched last time. So the actual properties themselves, they're defined in the Rust code, so in, in the servo code that we have in the tree, in, the, in those directories there. And each property actually has a Rust module with a number of things defined inside it. So we've got a Rust type for representing specified values of the property, a type for computed values. Sometimes they're the same, sometimes they're different. Uh, functions for parsing, serializing values of the properties, functions for converting between specified computed values and back again. Uh, but this is all a lot of code, and we don't want to write that out manually every single time, so we use some kind of code generation at build time to, uh, to generate this stuff. So the servo code uh, actually uses a templating language called Mako, or Mako. Um, it was originally designed for like web page templated generation, um, but it works just fine for generating Rust code. And we have a bunch of sort of helper functions which generate uh, all, of the, all of the code in those Rust modules to implement a property. So this is what the definition for background color looks like, for example, that lives in the, the background struct. Uh, and the little highlighted bit color in the string there, that uh, sort of identifies the, one of the number of predefined types that we support uh, in CSS properties. So we can have a bunch of custom parsing code and types for maybe some one-off properties uh, where we, we can't reuse these definitions. Uh, but a lot of them can use these reuse definitions like this one. Uh, all of that pre-processed content, after it gets processed, uh, gets output into a file called properties.rs in the object directory. And sometimes I find it a bit easier to have a look through that than try and work out exactly what these um, uh, templating things are doing. So that color that was mentioned in the, in the definition of background color actually refers to some Rust types that we've got. So in the, the values directory underneath servo compo component style, we've got types for specified values and for computed values, and this is what it looks like for 
properties that take colors. So we've got two different looking types here because the values that you can use in style sheets are kind of different from uh, the actual computed values that get represented in the end and which the rest of the layout system uses. So in style sheets, you can specify colors using the current color keyword. You can specify RGB values or a color keyword or a system color keyword. But in the end, they all get computed down into like an RGBA value plus some value which says how much current color to, um, to mix into it. So we've got types for the values, but these are Rust types. And the style structs are defined in C++, so they've got C++ members. So we need some way to convert those Rust values into C++ values. And this is what this uh, we call glue function, uh, glue code does in gecko.marco.rs. You might think that's a bit wasteful to have to do this extra conversion layer, but it doesn't actually end up turning up in profiles. Um, and we use... Uh, Bindings generation, we use Rust bindgen to parse all of the C++ files that the style structs use and output Rust definitions of them. And that gets output into the object directory as well in structs.rs, if you're interested. It's a little bit hard to read in there, but um, this is the kind of output that you can see. So the, st the background struct uh, looks like this, and the glue code, when it comes after at the last stage of the process of generating the computed style, when it wants to write a value into the style struct, it will take that Rust color, the computed color type, and it will convert it into, uh, well, it'll poke around in this style complex color uh, struct. So after the end of all that, uh, we've got all our elements have styling values. They're all written into the style structs. And the next part of the process is to create frames for the elements. So a frame, as Busy mentioned this morning, is like a rectangular area for the element. And it sort of basically matches up with the CSS concept of a box or maybe a fragment. Uh, and these are organized into a tree. So the, the base class for frames is NSI frame. And dis despite the name, it's not actually an XPCOM interface. So pro probably it should be renamed. Um, and we have a lot of different frame classes. I think there's more than 100 of them for various degrees of specialization for handling different, different kinds of elements. But the three most important are probably blocks, inlines, and text. So block frame is used for elements like divs and p's, inlines for span or strong or m, uh, and text frames are used for the actual text nodes in the DOM. This is what the frame tree looks like for my simple example. And it's a very straightforward, or the most straightforward case uh, that we can come up with in the frame tree. So every element has one corresponding frame. So the div gets a block frame. I should go this way. Uh, P gets a block frame. Span gets an inline frame. And those two frames, the block frame for the P and the inline for the span, are children of the block for the div. And the two text frames, which, uh, sorry, text nodes, which are in the DOM tree there, but I haven't shown, they get a text frame each. And I've shown in that little uh, diagram there on the left sort of where those frames end up. So the blue is the frame for the P, uh, the red is the frame for the span, and the dotted lines uh, surround the, the text frames. So this process of creating frames for the DOM tree is called frame construction, and that's the responsibility of a class called NSCSS Frame Constructor, which is a very, 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 very big C++ file. It's the second biggest C++ file in Mozilla Central, unfortunately, uh, just behind something that handles uh, IndexedDB. Um, and its basic job is to work out what kind of frame to create for every node and, and to go ahead and create it. Uh, and it also handles dynamic updates as well. So how does it decide what kind of frame to create? Well, in the, the most general case, if there's no specific rule, it will do that based on the value of the display property. So if display is block or inline block, we'll get a block frame. If display is inline, we'll get an inline frame. We have a bunch of special kinds of frames for particular, for particular elements. So if you have an HTML image element, that'll get an NS image frame. And sometimes we've got some other sort of custom logic for determining what kind of frame to create. So for example, for checkboxes, input type equals checkbox, most of the time that'll get an NS checkbox radio frame. Uh, but sometimes it won't. If mos appearance is none, then it'll sort of fall back to uh, creating one based on what the display value is. Sometimes we create more complicated frame trees. Uh, and in, that, in these cases, we end up creating more than one frame for a particular element. So these gray boxes here are what we call anonymous boxes. So they're additional frames that are created. 
And they're sort of, in this case, they're associated with, with this div. So let me run through this example. So this is, um, this is one case where we create anonymous boxes. It's uh, with Flexbox. So if you have a Flexbox container, so this div style display flex, it requires that all of its children are blocks. If all of its children are elements, then that's kind of easy to do. So we can just sort of ensure that the display value for the child elements just get set to block. Uh, and that's what's happened here. That's why we have an NS block frame for the span. But if you've got text nodes, so because we've got three flex items here, we can't just create a block frame for the text node because then we'll have nothing to actually handle the, the text content. So we end up creating a wrapper block for those items there. Uh, these are called anonymous boxes because there's no way to address them from content. They're sort of hidden away. Uh, but a lot of the time, the CSS spec requires particular anonymous boxes to be created, or at least for the effects uh, to be visible in the layout in the end. But we can address them from user agent style sheets. So when we create anonymous boxes, we have a particular pseudo element name that we use. Uh, these ones are called Moz Anonymous Flex items. And then we can provide some styling for those things from the UA style sheets. So in this case, we have a display block rule for these things. So that's why they end up getting uh, block frames. Another kind of related concept, well, maybe only in that it's got anonymous in the name as well, is native anonymous content. Uh, this is a mechanism for frames to be able to create extra DOM elements that get hidden away uh, under the, the target element to implement in some special way uh, some element. So for example, input type equals file is implemented using native anonymous content. So visually, that appears like a button and a label next to it. And the, the main frame for input type equals file, NS file control frame at the top, it implements an interface called NSI anonymous content creator, I think. Uh, and that allows it to produce some extra elements to sort of hide off underneath the input element. So it does that. It creates a, a button element, an HTML button, and a Zool label, which I assume will change to a span or something pretty soon. Uh, and the frame constructor, as it's producing frames, it will, it will ask for the frame that it just created. Do you implement that interface? If so, can you give me some extra content? And then it will just progress and uh, create frames for those extra elements that were created. So it's anonymous as well, so content in the page can't actually poke into that thing. It's kind of similar to what XBL, or as I've discovered today, is pronounced Zibble. Uh, can do, uh, but, it's, but it's done using C++ code rather than script, which is where native uh, in the name comes from. So there's various other cases where we have like complicated frame tree things, but, but it's not particularly important. Um, once we have the frame tree created, then we can go and work out what the actual layout of the document looks like. So after frame construction, we don't know where these things are. We don't know how big they're going to be. We just know the sort of hierarchical structure of them because we've put them into a tree. So reflow is the process of going over that tree and working out the sizes and positions of all the frames. And the end result for each frame is that we set its mrect, which is a field on NSI frame, which is the uh, rectangular area for that frame relative to its parent, and a few other things like uh, computing how much like overflow outside that rectangle it might need to paint or its descendants might need to paint, which comes up sometimes like if you have overflowing content outside of some container or maybe you have some fancy font glyph that likes to go outside its inbox a lot. And generally, this computes a size for each frame based on how much the parent says, how much space there is for it to, to fit. And normally that's based on how much, how much width there is. So reflow is handled by this reflow method on NSI frame, which will do something different for, for different kinds of frames. And its responsibility is to reflow all of its children, position them appropriately, and then return some size information about itself. The input to this method is a reflow input object, uh, which, the, which the parent provides. And that, most importantly, has uh, the available width and height that the parent has uh, for the children. So the available width is going to be something that ultimately gets based on like the browser width, the browser window width. Uh, and as you sort of reflow down the tree, that might get narrower and narrower. Uh, height is usually actually some special unconstrained value. So in normal, normal browser mode, um, 
we want elements to sort of get as big as they want to be. Even if some container has some fixed height, we let it overflow rather than sort of s sticking it to squish inside uh, the container. Only in cases like uh, columns and when we're printing, when we have paginated content, do we actually have some constrained size that children need to fit within. And there's other inputs as well, like what the computed values for width and height and margin padding borders are on, on the element that we're about to reflow. The output of the method, which the reflow needs to compute, is how big the frame wants to be based on that available size. And also how much space it needs on the outside if it, for, the, for its overflow in case it wants to uh, paint outside of its rectangle. And there's a third parameter, an output parameter, which has a few flags on it, which I'll mention in a minute. So as I say, each frame does something different when it reflows. Uh, text frames, when they're called to reflow, will produce something called a text run, which is a, uh, an object from graphics code that represents a uh, list of, or sequence of uh, glyphs and where they are positioned. So that's based on sort of the font information, the styling font information, what fonts you have available on the system, and the actual particular text that that text frame has been created for. And from that, it knows how big it wants to be. Inline frames will reflow by taking all of their children. It, it will have like inline and text children and just sort of placing them left to right. And a block frame is a little bit more complicated. So blocks organize all of their children into lines. Uh, if it has a block child, it'll take up a whole line. In lines, you can fit multiple of them on one line. And for each line, it will go and reflow all of the children that are in that line, place them left to right. Uh, and then it will do some alignment on that line, so uh, do things needed for text align, which might shift them left and right, vertical align, which might move them up and down to do like baseline alignment or top alignment. And for each line as it does that, it keeps a track of the vertical position as it goes down, placing lines. Uh, so in the end, you have a whole like, uh, laid out block uh, of a number of lines. So speaking of lines, that might bring up the question, what happens if you run out of space on a line? So reflow is also responsible for uh, fragmentation. So that's breaking of lines, columns, and pages. So that extra out param that I mentioned has a flag on it which indicates whether a frame was able to reflow itself and if it thinks it's going to be able to fit or not. So we, we call that complete and incomplete. So if it's incomplete, then the frame thinks, I wasn't able to fit all of my content and my descendants uh, in the available space that was given to me. And if that happens, then it'll return up to its parent, and the parent frame will notice that flag and think, OK, well, I'd better do something about that. And that something is that it creates a new frame, what we call a continuation frame, for the frame that couldn't fit itself. And that's basically like a, a, a clone of that frame. So it's, another, it's a new frame of the same type. So if a text frame couldn't fit, it'll create a new text frame. If an inline couldn't fit, it'll create a new inline frame. And for the content that didn't fit, which might include some subsequent uh, children of that parent, uh, it'll stash them away somewhere so that as reflow progresses, the new frame, the continuation frame, can grab them out and uh, continue on reflowing. So that subsequent frame is going to be like on a new line, for example, uh, and it can grab out the remaining, the remaining items. So text frames are probably the things that, that uh, need to get broken the most. So they sort of remember where in, the, where in the text frame, where in the content, uh, the break has to go. So after it's produced its text run, it'll, like, do some, it'll do some measurement based on like the words in there and how much available safe space there was and determine, OK, I need to be broken at this point. So that once we come to reflow the continuation for that text frame, it knows where to pick off. So it's a bit, maybe a bit hard to understand in text form there. So this is uh, what the frame tree looks like when breaking is involved. So uh, this example has a paragraph uh, and a span that says, well, the paragraph says this is how line breaking is handled, and the line breaking is wrapped in a span, and the break needs to happen inside that span because of the, the width. So as we go and reflow, initially we'll have a single text frame for that text line breaking, but when the text frame is reflowed, it will find out, oh, there's not enough horizontal space for me left on the line. So it will return to its parents and say, okay, I'm incomplete, and the parent, the P, its reflow method will say, OK, well, I will create a new continuation for you, another text frame, and it will uh, continue on reflowing 
And once we continue to reflow this second text frame, which has been inserted at the right place in the tree, that new text frame will pick up where the previous one left off because it knows that it needs to pick off from well, where, where the space is in, in that text string. Then we'll discover that actually its parent also couldn't fit. So the inline frame also couldn't fit and needs to be broken. So the inline frame, when it reflows, it will, it will return to its parent and say, well, I'm incomplete as well. So the block frame for the paragraph uh, will handle creating a continuation frame for the inline. And then when it gets reflowed, then it'll end up putting that continuation for the text frame inside it. So that, this is what the, the frame structure looks like in the end after that process. So those green ones are the continuation frames. Um, and we actually, we put, um, we use linked lists to sort of uh, connect all of the continuations for a particular element in the chain because it's quite a common operation to need to iterate over those things and that's not as easy if you have to traverse the whole tree to find them. Uh, and this kind of breaking where you break, break some frame, like the text frame, which means you have to break the parent, which means you have to break the parent, is uh, quite common. So if you had, you can imagine like how many ever wrapping spans you had, you would have to need to break them all until you get up to the block frame. And in the cases of columns and pages, you might need to break parent block, parent block, parent block uh, until, until it can fit in the next column or page. So this is all sort of from the perspective of we're doing initial layout of the page, and we also need to handle dynamic changes. So we have uh, different code for handling different parts of the pipeline. We have an object called Restyle Manager, which listens for DOM changes, so things like maybe changing the class name or the ID or text content, uh, and uh, in response, schedule some restyling of the tree. When we do those restyles, uh, so we're styling some element. We found that it had some styles before. Uh, we produced something called an NS change hint, which is like a bit field of work that needs to happen in response to those style changes. So that's actually produced by a function called calc difference on all of the style structs, which will like compare each of the fields and see what kind of work is required for the particular changes that happened. And these changes, they're, they're pretty granular. So for example, if you only change the color property of something, then you maybe only need to repaint the frame. If you change the font size, then you probably need to reflow it. If you change the display property, you're gonna have to recreate a whole frame for it. So some of these are more expensive than others, and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty good system for introducing new optimizations for particular properties. It's pretty easy to add like a new value into NS change hint and handle that. So the calc difference methods on each style struct produce the change hints, and there's a function called process restyled frames which goes, go, goes over those uh, change hints and actually actions them. For frame construction, the frame constructor also listens to DOM changes, so when content gets inserted or removed, we will create or destroy frames uh, for that content. And a lot of the complication that's in frame constructor, the reason it's so big is there are a lot of invariants to maintain uh, to handle all of these uh, dy dynamic cases. And we try hard to coalesce processing these changes as well uh, because we don't want to have to like blow away frames, recreate frames if you have like a tight loop in JavaScript where we're setting display in none, display in line, display in none, display in line, uh, if, if the rest of the script is not going to observe it. So we, we do a lot of this coalescing by setting bits, uh, dirty bits inside the DOM, the DOM tree, in the frame tree, and only flush those when we need to. So when script queries style or queries uh, layout, um, yeah, or when uh, the refresh driver does its ticking at 60 frames a second, then we'll also flush. So that's, that's basically the high-level overview of what layout's responsible for. Uh, what's our team going to work on besides maybe some more CSS features and web compat work, which are probably pretty important? Um, well, we don't know yet. Uh, we've been gathering a list of things that we might work on and hopefully we'll uh, decide later this week. So maybe we could do the frame construction in parallel. This is what Servo does. Uh, maybe we can create text runs for text frames when they get reflowed in parallel because uh, that often comes up in uh, profiles as well. A lot of these things we'll have to make sure that we're actually solving the right problems here and profiling and, and analyzing before we actually spend some effort going into them. But I think one, one, of the, one of the things that we will find a win with is profiling and rewriting some existing code because the layout module actually has a lot of old code. Um, I made a graph here of uh, giving some indication of like the age of code um, that we have in the code base. 
So this is like showing cumulative age of uh, percentage of lines of code. Red here is for Mozilla Central overall. Th this is only C++, by the way. Uh, so for example, if you look at uh, greater than 10, so this is what percentage of the code base is more than 10 years old? In Mozilla Central overall, it's like 6 or 7%. In the layout module, it's uh, 20%. So 20% of layout code is more than 10 years old. More than 15 years old, Mozilla Central is like maybe 3%, but 10% of layout code is like more than 15 years old. So I think there's, uh, it's um, maybe a little bit scary seeing this, uh, but there's probably also a lot of opportunity for doing some improvements and profiling and making things faster in the existing code without having to have a, a massive new project uh, like Stylo, which might take a long time. Um, so that's what I wanted to leave you with, uh, and uh, that is indeed the end of my talk. And I'm happy to answer some questions as well. So uh, Marco is used for the properties. Yes. Could Rust macros be used for that? I think that's a good question, because I think the Marco templates are they're kind of hard to understand. Um, if Rust macros, and I haven't been keeping up with what like, new style macros are able to do, were able to represent all the definitions of properties and do the right code generation, then I would say yes. But it sounds like Emilio has some opinion on that just behind you. I, no, I just, wanted to, I just wanted to point out that all this macro stuff predates the capability from Rust to, do, to have like procedural macros. So we've done a bunch of work to move uh, code from macro templates to like the types themselves and use a like, custom derive when that was introduced. Uh, so now, like, the micro code is just mostly a description of the property that could be, like, it doesn't even need to be macro necessarily. Like, you could theoretically replace the step where we, like, run macro and generate a bunch of Rust code. You could write a Rust program that, in a build script that does it. And just to be a little contrary in here, um, I think there's a huge amount of value of it being, like, dead simple and dumb and the fact that it actually outputs a text file that you can read rather than having to understand, like, Rust macros. So I don't want to forget that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, I got two questions. Mm -hmm. So the first question is, uh, is there an obvious way to observe the, the uh, friend tree and the, and the changes on the friend tree, like being, visual, being able to visualize it? Um, being able to introduce that to general web developers. And the second question would be more Gecko specific, like uh, that's, that is, is there any caveats or limits to the native anonymous content, like you, something that you definitely shouldn't do in it, or something you definitely shouldn't try to implement in it? Thanks. For uh, visualizing the frame tree, we don't really have anything targeted towards web developers. Uh, as a Gecko developer, we have tools for dumping out information about the frame tree. So if you're familiar with the, uh, the layout debugger tool, so if you start Firefox with muck run and then you say dash layout debug and put a URL or a file name after that, it'll start up the browser in some like very simple Chrome mode, which basically just has like an address bar and like a button to reload uh, the page. And it has some extra menu items for like dumping, dumping the DOM tree, dumping the frame tree. And dumping, that, that will get dumped to standard out. And it's just like a sort of textual representation of what the frame tree looks like. But I mean, that's, that's reasonable. I use that quite often when I'm debugging. Um, nothing for showing what changes happen dynamically. But I would just tend to like dump the frame tree, do something, dump the frame tree, and then have a look. Um, for the second question, what was it again? Um, uh, native anonymous content. Um, I don't think you need to be avoiding native anonymous content particularly. Um, it's probably the right solution for um, replacing a bunch of these XBL definitions. It does, native anonymous content does have some interesting properties in terms of how it uh, does styling in the subtree, especially if you want to expose parts of the subtree using pseudo elements. Probably you don't want to do that though, so, so it's probably okay, I think. Yeah, thanks. I disagree with that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, 
I mean, I generally don't like native anonymous content because this thing which like we create while we're running layout, and then like it's very easy for dump code to just mess up and start start trying to change stuff, uh, and then like that kind of it has the same problem with like Sybil where like you like the CSS rules that you specify with Sybil can change the CSS rules that have already applied to the tree, and and I mean we have assertions to prevent that, but like it would be better if we didn't have to worry about that problem at all and we use like something like Shadow DOM or stuff like that. Yeah, so you may, may, maybe you're right. So it might depend on like the complexity of the, the thing that you're trying to implement is. Like if it's pretty simple, then I, I wouldn't avoid like adding a new uh, native anonymous content thing that's pretty similar to existing ones. If you had something which is very dynamic and you want to change the subtree or handle like restyling things, then maybe you'd be better off having some Shadow DOM implemented thing, if that's possible. I don't know if that's possible yet for built in things. I have two follow up thoughts on that regarding visualizing the frame tree and changes to it. Um, one is that you can, you can turn on paint flashing, which is kind of separated by like one layer. It's technically what we're repainting in the graphics code, but that often shows you what bits of the frame tree are changing. Um, that's visible in DevTools. Uh, you have to enable it. I think it's an extra checkbox in the DevTools settings, but then it shows up as a little paintbrush. Um, and then also at some point over maybe the next year, the developer experience team may add a layout debugger tool, which would kind of be a, a little bit like the DOM inspector, but for layout boxes. Um, it's the scope of that is a little bit undefined right now because of a lot of the layout boxes uh, particularly for like anonymous wrapper frames may or may not actually be interesting to web developers. They might just kind of be uh, implementation details that would just confuse someone trying to figure out what's going on in their page. Um, but uh, yeah, for now, the dumped frame tree in text form is kind of what we've got, I think. Sorry, uh, follow up to the follow up question. Um, I'm sure I missed this. What is native anonymous content and what role does it play? Perhaps so that was covered, I'm sorry. I was late. In native anonymous content is uh, extra DOM elements that frames decide to create for themselves uh, and get hidden away just like sort of XBL anonymous content to implement some elements. So for example, a bunch of form controls are implemented in this way. Uh, like, uh, so I showed the, uh, the file input control. It creates like a button and a, and a label child element. Yeah, so and they're implemented in C++, so there's some interface you implement which generates those DOM elements. Thank you. Sorry. Mm -hmm. That's right. Hey. Um, are we implementing the Houdini APIs, and does that cause any like architectural changes to the stuff you've been talking about? So w at the very moment, we're not. I think we need to decide soon what we're doing with Houdini. Because uh, you know, like Google's like steaming on ahead, um, and it may well have architectural implications. And I think the task of somebody soon is to dig into that and work out what those are. But I don't think somebody has done that work. Hi. Uh, what is the purpose of native anonymous content? Like, uh, why is it required? So it's. It's kind of just like an implementation strategy. If you have some element that you could easily implement, if you had some other sort of tree of elements or list of other elements uh, to implement it in terms of. So for example, that input control, which has the button and the label, uh, as if you think sort of like as a web developer, if you, if you were trying to create what an input control looks like, you would probably just want to use like a button and a span or something like that. Uh, the alternative would be to have like a single frame which handled all of the behavior of that button and the label and making sure that like mouse events get dispatched to the right thing and you like repaint the button in the correct way if you click on the left side but not on the right side. So for cases where you can think the implementation of some element can be quite simple, if you think of it as really representing some other tree of elements, then I think that's when you would use native anonymous content. You also want to use it for like CSS pseudo elements that content can address, like column column before and column column after. Like those are defined to be elements itself. And it would be pretty hard to like make them act as an element without being an element. Like it would be sort of annoying. 
And there's a bit, just as a last note, there's a lot of complication that I didn't cover as well, like how a float's handled, how a writing mode's handled. I, I was always talking left to right, top to bottom, um, and these things are very complicated. Um, yeah. <laughs> anyway, thank you.